Bibles out tonight. And we're going to start a new series. And we're going to pick up in the book of Esther this evening. And the goal of this is probably slightly different than some of the Wednesday nights I, I, I do many times, but we're going to cover every chapter here. We'll, we'll, we'll should probably read every verse as we go through the chapter as well, and we're going to break down the kind of the chapter as we read along. So I do not have scripture on the on the screen for you tonight because it's going to be so intermittent, and there's some of these chapters are a little bit longer, and that's that's a lot of work for me. So you're going to have to bring your Bible on Wednesdays, all right? So <laughs> I got lazy when I was sitting in the chair for three weeks. No, I'm kidding, but uh, no, there's just sub, it, there's a lot, and it's it's broken up with each point, and then you have to change slides and. It's just, uh, it's a little bit tougher. So um, so we're going to pick up with the book of Esther tonight. Anybody need an outline that didn't get one? That wants one? All right. Our young teenager here, Heidi, she's going to deliver them for us. <laughs> Anybody else need one? In the back? And then on this whole, this whole side over here, Heidi. Thank you. I think this should become Heidi's official uh, mode of service for the church. What do you think? The official outline passer outerer. <laughs> yeah. How many of you found Esther now? Because it's been a while. All right. I always go to Psalms and just turn back because it's you know Psalms is like right there and then you come across a little easier that way. So. All right. Everybody good. Six seventy two. <laughs> the uh, the title we've given for our series tonight is God is now here. Uh, many might read that as God is nowhere, and if you really think about the book of Esther, uh, it's probably the only book I believe in the entire scriptures that doesn't mention the name of God. Um, his name is not not spoken in here. Um, it's uh, one of only two books in Scripture named after women, uh, Esther and Ruth. And uh, I think, did Ruth get studied recently? Did, did you do re Ruth recently, Nolan? Been a while? Okay, okay. I, I, I could be mistaken too, so okay. All right. Um, so the, anyway, it's one of the two. Um, the name of God, again, is not mentioned in the pages of the book of Ruth, but it's very evident to see his providence. His guidance, his his hand at work. It's not. It doesn't take you long to see exactly what God is doing. Uh, the time of the book of Esther, uh, it seems to be between 486 BC and 465 BC. So there's about a a 20ish year span there where it could have started, could have been written, could have been finished uh, in that in that kind of time frame. Uh, the king here uh, that sits on the throne in the book of Esther is a man by the name of Ahasuerus. Um, this man of Hazarus is probably also somebody you might know a name better of, Xerxes. Um, this is probably the same individual. Um, Xerxes, of course, was a great, great, great Persian king that ruled during this period of time. Um, names, many times during this time, are confusing because some were names and some were titles. And so you, you really got to kind of do a dissection and you kind of figure out what, what, who's being talked about and that type of thing. But I'm, I'm fairly confident that it was Xerxes as well as Hazarus. Um, a large number of Jews are in captivity still. You remember the Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C. Uh, took all of the nation of Israel into captivity. Uh, of course, the Babylonians were then conquered by the Persians. And so now the Persians are in control of Babylonian uh, um, prisoners as well as the Jewish prisoners that were still intact there uh, through the Babylonians. So a large number of them are still there in captivity. Uh, they many times in captivity, as you would you know, think about any enemy, were under persecution. Uh, they were under threat of extermination many times. Uh, you remember back in Egypt, you know, they, they started growing too large. And so what they do? Let's put them in bondage. Uh, and, and so you would see that, and that's happening even the, during these days. Um, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, we'll, we'll get into the outline here and start reading some scripture here. But in chapter 1, I just want to introduce the book here. Uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2 is the only time we hear of the lady by the name of Queen Vashti. Uh, Queen Vashti, of course, is married to King Ahasuerus. Uh, she's mentioned in those two chapters. We do not know a lot about her. Uh, we do not know a lot about her history. We do not know a lot about what happens to her after this event. 
Uh, but she's a shining example of a woman who, maybe we don't give her credit for a lot of things, but she did have at least some standards. Uh, she had a little bit of gumption about her and a little bit of, uh, of determination to say, I'm not going to take, take part in something stupid that this moron husband is asking me to do. Uh, now, again, in, in, in doing what she did could have led to her death. It, it, it led to her exile. Uh, but she had some, some, some principles. Yeah, thank you. Uh, she, she, she had a little bit of respect for herself to say, I'm not going to do what he's asking me to do. Um, we see in all this, from chapter 1 all the way to the end of the, of the book, you see God behind the scenes. You don't see him up at the front. You don't see him throwing lightning. You don't see, you know, earthquakes. But he's behind the scenes moving, moving the settings, moving the time, moving the people, moving the places. And in spite of the wickedness of man, uh, God uses the removal of Ashtai to bring the installation of Esther. And without Esther, and again, I know God could do anything, but according to you know, what we read in the book of Esther, without Esther following God's plan here, the Jews would have been doomed. And so, so all of this happens with God moving behind the scenes. And, and so we want to look at the, again, we're just going to kind of break down the chapter as we go through it tonight. If you're familiar with the story of Esther, this is not going to be anything new to you. Uh, but I just want to kind of go through verse by verse and kind of show you, hey, here's, here's what's happening, here's what's happening here, here's what's happening here. We've got a little detail as we go through it as well. So uh, the first thing you'll see, and this is the title of our lesson tonight, the king gives a great feast. And this is chapter one's theme. Um, now, do understand this. Uh, a feast in those days is quite a bit different than a feast in these days. Okay, they didn't go to the Golden Corral, all right, or the old country buffet, <laughs> all right. It's a bit, bit different, okay? Uh, you're talking massive quantity of, of foods, luxuries. Uh, of course, uh, alcohol was a defining trait of most of these feats, uh, feasts. Um, they would go on for days and days and days, all kinds of, uh, of debauchery and sin would take place at these things. And uh, so Vashti, again, made a wise decision to say, I'm not, I'm not stepping foot in this junk, okay? Uh, and so as the king gives a great feast, let's look at the chapter and we'll read some scriptures here as we go down through the outline. Uh, the first thing I want to point out here, and we'll see this in the first nine verses, and uh, we'll kind of explain as we read through here, but a drunken feast is called. Again, I want us to understand that. There was a reason for this feast, and it wasn't just food. Uh, the, 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 the driving, motivating factor for most of these feasts was, hey, let's go, let's go drink. Let's go get drunk. Let's go party, okay? Uh, and it may look differently now than it looked then, uh, but unfortunately sometimes the same thing is being, uh, uh, you know, taught and promoted in our, in our college campuses and, and so on and so forth later in life. But uh, a drunken feast is called, look at verse 1 and 2 first, and then we'll give you, uh, I'll try to read the scripture and then give you the point. I may end up switching it. We'll, we'll just see. But uh, look at verse 1 and 2. Now it came to pass in the days of Hazarus, this is Hazarus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. We'll come back to that. That in those days when the king of Hazarus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace. Uh, I want to show you, first of all, uh, the vastness of his reign. And I know this doesn't have anything to do with the drunken feast per se, but it kind of kicks it off to get us where we need to be. Uh, I want to show you, I got a little map here. Boy, that purdy. Uh, my, my clicker, my pointer won't work. So I want to show you the, uh, the vastness of the rain. If you look here at this region of land, uh, the Middle East here is where, where we're talking about. And you see India up in the right-hand corner there, the big yellow. Big yellow, India. See Larry's making us a little circle there. Um, look at how vast it goes. It spreads from India all the way across, if you look to the left there, all the way to Ethiopia. A good portion of Africa, if you, you can see, you, know, you see the Sudan, uh, you see uh, part of Libya, uh, Ethiopia, of course, Egypt. Uh, all that is included. This is where he's reigning. That, that's, a, that's a pretty, pretty, pretty good-sized area, okay? Uh, so, so this party that he's calling, here's what I want you to understand. If he's calling it and he's the king, you know where these people are coming from? Everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, so he's going to have a pretty good turnout for this, this drunken party that he's called. Uh, look at verse number 3. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all the princes and his servants. Uh, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. Uh, the, the second thing you notice about this is this. The, the, the feast was actually for the elite rulers in the kingdom. So although we say there's a lot of people coming from all over the place, this was kind of, uh, of geared for my leadership team. 
<laughs> Let's all get together and party, right? Uh, my, 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 uh, my governors, my princes, my, my guys that have the most power in these areas. I want you to come, you know, bring, your, bring your wives. They would bring their, their best wife with them. We'll get to that later. Uh, and, and maybe a couple of servants, whatever. And they would come and they would travel to attend this. So that feast was for the elite rulers. It wasn't just for the common person. Uh, look at verse 4. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and fourscore days. The feast lasted a hundred and eighty days. I don't know about you. When somebody comes to my house to visit, 18 minutes is enough, you know? I'm ready, I'm ready for you to go. I want to put the TV on and put my feet up in the recliner, right? 180 days, people are in this guy's palace, wandering, meandering, drinking, doing who knows what, who knows where. <laughs> Think about this. That's what's taking place. He's showing off his wealth. He's showing off his place. This is, this is Xerxes, right? The, 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 uh, of course, the, the, many of the modern day movies make him out to be, the, the, he can call himself the God King, right? Um, and, and you look at that and you think, wow, that's a long period of time. I'd hate to have to be the cooks or the cleanup crew <laughs> during that particular feast. Uh, look at verse 5 and 6. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days, in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white, green, and blue hangings, fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. The feast climaxed uh, the long celebration. So for 180 days, he partied with his buddies. And then in the last after that, he has another feast. <laughs> I don't know if this was a bigger feast, a better feast. The, the best food came out. I, I don't know how it all worked. But all the colorful decorations were set out. Uh, the, the wreaths of gold and silver, all the, all the beauty and splendor he's again showing off now. Other people were, were able to kind of attend and see some of this. You see some of the, the smaller people there were kind of invited to this. And so you see this drunken feast takes place. Look at uh, verse 7 and 8. And they gave them drink and vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another. It's okay to have non-matching dishes. See that? <laughs> and, that's right. And royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Uh, you're going to see here in that verse, you kind of see this principle. Uh, let me get it to come up here. Uh, an abundance of wine was served in these golden vessels. Now again, they've already partied for 100 days. Now, 180 days. Now they're in this last feast. You see even more. It's just, this is their thing. All right. This is what they're doing. They're partying. Um, you know, I, I thought about that, and of course, he, he even tells his officers, people can do what they want. Don't stop them. If you feel like, well, they shouldn't do that. It's against the law. Too bad. Let them, ha let them have their fun. Okay? That's what's going on. And, and I just want to get to the thing. I know this is Wednesday night crowd. You don't need to hear this, but that is, that is, that is some of the effects of alcohol. It's what it does. Uh, you know, it, des it desensitizes us. Uh, uh, it opens us up to do things, you know, we never thought we may have. And that's why the Bible is very, very cautionary on strong drink. Now, I know there's a raging debate. I'm not going to take part in it. I am not going to debate somebody about it because I know uh, what I believe and I know what I believe the Bible teaches. Uh, some will say, well, alcohol is okay as long as you don't get drunk. That's what it says. Be not drunk with wine. So if you're not drunk, it's okay. Drink, drink as much as you want. Wow. Did you know if you, if you don't drink, you can't get drunk? Think about it. If you never smoke marijuana, you can't get addicted to it. You know? You, don't, you never, you never uh, I don't even know what drugs are these days. <laughs> you know? Whatever. Maybe if, you never, if you never partake in it, you can't get addicted to it. And, and by the way, I, I'll just kind of throw this out there. There's all kinds of scripture warnings about the dangers of alcohol. So even if you want to argue with me, well, as long as you don't get drunk, I, I care to take the danger and the warning signs enough to say, look, if there's that many warnings about it, I think I can just avoid it altogether. <laughs> I don't think that's going to be a problem. Yeah, and Habakkuk talks about it. It says, uh, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink, uh, that puttest the bottle to him and makest him drunk, and also that thou mayest look on her nakedness. So you see, you see a warning about offering it. 
uh, look not upon the wine when it is red. I give it color in the cup when it moveth itself right, Proverbs says. Proverbs 31 says this, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Because what happens? When leadership is affected, fellowship is affected. Does that make sense? If the king's going to be an example of glutton or drunkenness, who's going to stop everybody else from following that example? And so you see, you see all kinds, and again, I'm not going to get into all of them, there's all kinds of warnings about it, especially in the area of leadership. Uh, you remember Noah? Remember Noah got drunk? What happened? <laughs> uh, he, he brought judgment on his son, his grandson, and, and really the whole human race as a result. You see this in Scripture. So the warning is there. So the abundance of wine was served. And look at, look at verse number 9. We'll finish up this, this point. Um, also, Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. So Queen Vashti gives a feast for the wives separately. Um, again, the custom was for the man that, the, the, that was coming to this party to bring his first wife or his best wife or his favorite wife, you know, if he had more than one, uh, he'd bring who he wanted to. Um, the thing about this is there's never any indication that Vashti's party turned into a drunken party. It's never mentioned. It's never hinted at. Uh, it, it, it's never said. Um, and so I think, <laughs> I think the women had their feast different because they knew what the men were turning into at the other, <laughs> at the other party, right? So I don't blame them. So, so Vashti has her own separate feast for there. So that's, that's the first thing as we open the, 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 the uh, text up there in the first nine verses. Look at the second thing. After you see a drunken feast called, uh, number two, a wicked demand is made. A wicked demand is made. Uh, two verses here that we'll look at, um, verse number 10 and verse number 11. Let's start verse number 10. On the seventh day, again, this is the seven-day feast following the 180-day feast. Okay, So we're 187 days in to feasting. Uh, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, that does not mean he was happy. Okay, The, the dude was toasted. All right, He was bombed. All right, He commanded <laughs> all these people... Mahuman and Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zethar and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus, the king. Uh, so let me give you a couple thoughts here. First of all, it's a seven-day drunken party after a 180-day drunken party. <laughs> I don't know how you can get more. I don't, I've never been drunk. I've never, I, I, and I'm not bragging or patting myself on the back. I've never tasted alcohol. Uh, the smell of it alone is enough to say I'm not even interested. But... Uh, I don't know if you can get more drunk on 187th day than you were the 144th day. I don't know. I don't know. But this, this is a seven-day drunken party. Uh, verse number 10 tells us the king was no doubt drunk. His heart was merry. Um, we're going to see the demand he makes. No, no doubt in my mind as a man and as a husband, the request he makes of his wife would not have been made had I been in my right mind. Okay, uh, It wouldn't have been made had I, had I not been drunk. Again, the best way to avoid the drunkenness is simply just don't partake. Um, that makes sense, makes sense to me. Uh, and again, I think it makes sense, com common sense there. The third thing you see is this. And I mentioned this, kind of uh, alluded to it a minute ago, but wicked rulers use strong drink to often influence and mislead others. Uh, because it's such a popular thing, especially in our day, especially in their day, they knew they could use it to control the situation, to control the followers, to control the, the staff, whoever it may be. Um, I, I wasn't living during those days, but in the days of uh, Roosevelt and Churchill and Truman, um, the Russians poured vodka uh, at them like nobody's business. Uh, two different areas at Yalta and Potsdam. Uh, they made sure, hey, let's supply the Americans with, with vodka, vodka, vo that's the only Russian word I can say, vodka, vodka. But uh, there's... <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind, again, as you study history, the reason they did that led to the bad decisions that we made as Americans involving the communists. And because of the bad decisions, Eastern Europe was uh, handed to the communists for many years. You see, the, the wiles and the power and the influence of alcohol, these leaders, they're not stupid, okay? 
they know they know what it can accomplish. They know what it can do. They know how it can help them in their in their rule or in their reign or in their pushing their agenda or whatever. And so many times that's used to to, to mislead uh, 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 others that are following. And so we see that we see it in American history. We we see it here as well. Look at verse number eleven. And we're going to kind of get down to the uh, to the to the request that he is making here. Verse number eleven. Uh, uh, he's asked those seven chambermen to go and get Vashti. So do, he says, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. He sends for the queen who was famous for her beauty. Um, she was known as a very uh, pretty woman. Uh, that, that, that there's, there's really no discussion there. She's known for that. Uh, it says she was fair to look upon. Uh, and so he calls for the woman, uh, his wife, and he says, I want my guests to envy at what I have. I want them to admire you in such a way that they're jealous of what I have. Now, I'm just going to say this, and I don't want to be gross or anything like that. You're dealing with a whole room of drunk men. And you want to bring your wife in there to show you how pretty she is so that you'll be jealous. And last time I checked, because alcohol desensitizes us, that jealousy many times leads to anger, uh, 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 covetousness, uh, and, and in doing something I shouldn't do, which maybe would be to uh, try to force myself on that wife or to take that wife or whatever the case may be. And so his, his logic is so flawed because of the, uh, the, the, uh, the condition that he's in. Uh, I, lo- I love what the Bible says in Proverbs 31. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Now, again, I don't know Vashti's relationship with the Lord. I know she had some principles she stood on, and we should praise her for that. Uh, but, but this wicked demand is made. Uh, he, he, of course, he's wanting her to come and, and, and dance before these men and, and do all these lewd activities. And, and uh, we're going to see that Vashti has to make a decision here. And so a wicked demand is made in verse 10 and 11. Look at verse number 12. Verse number 12, and we'll cover the third point here just in in verse number 12, all right? Verse number 12, but the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Boy, now you have alcohol and anger combining. This is is not a good good situation. Uh, So this means the queen. Look first of all this. Again, I don't know this, but she may not have known God. She may have known God, but she certainly had principles. And those principles prevailed in the life uh, of Vashti at this particular time. Uh, Proverbs eleven twenty two says this, As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, you, you may have one certain thing going for you. But boy, when you stand for right, that means so much more than everything else. And uh, so she may not have known God. Uh, but she definitely has some principles, and she stuck by them in verse number 12. By the way, at the risk of her life, I, I think I put that down next, uh, she knew what that might cost her, okay? Uh, death's on the line. You don't defy the king, <laughs> okay? Uh, the, king, the king has the final word. The king has the final say. He sent seven men to get you, and she's like, ain't a coming. I don't know about you. I'd hate to be the seven men having to go back to the king, right? <laughs> And, of course, we see his, his fit of rage, and that's letter C there. Uh, the king went into a rage. All reasoning left him. All sanity left him. Now, I don't know if he was normally, you know, a, a person of rage. I mean, I mean, he's a warrior, obviously. I don't know if he was normally a, a short-fused person. I don't know. But, again, some of this, you've got to think about some of the effects of the alcohol now are, are causing this as well. Um, we would do well to remember that even though he was upset and didn't get what he, didn't get what he wanted, boo-hoo-hoo. Anger is never the solution. We also have stern biblical warnings on anger. Um, he that is soon to angry dealeth foolishly. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth the spirit better than he that taketh the city. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. James says this, those are all Proverbs. James says this, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Have you, ever, have, you, have you figured this out in your life? My anger 
never equates to what God would have done. <laughs> what I do in anger never would have been what God would have done. <laughs> never. It doesn't work that way. It's the opposite usually. And, and so the disobedience of the queen, she did it as a cost to her life, but standing on her principles. And of course, we see what happens. The king goes into a fit of rage. Fit of rage. Let's, see the, let's see the result then here, this last one, number four. Look at the dethroning of the queen. And again, she is losing her palace. She's losing her treasures. She's losing her position, her, her, her uh, handmaids. Uh, everything that she has lived now with as the queen is being taken from her. And she's being cast out. Why? <laughs> For making a good choice. She made a wise choice. And again, like I said, had that husband been in his right mind, you, you men out there that are married, uh, there's no way in the world you would have asked this of your wife had you been in, in the right mind. And when she refuses because she is in the right mind, and you get mad and say, I'll just get rid of you then. <laughs> and that's kind of what happens here. The dethroning of the queen. Look at verse 13. I want to kind of show you how this plays out here. Uh, verse 13. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. He consults, first of all, the wise men, which knew the times. Uh, these were likely um, astrologers, those that studied the stars, knew you know, when a certain uh, cycle of the moon and, and that kind of thing, all the stuff that I don't understand because I ain't smart enough. All right, That's these kind of guys. Um, <laughs> the thing is this, these guys were also known, if you, if you read and study scripture especially, they were known for usually giving bad advice. <laughs> okay? That's the first people he goes to. Okay? The Bible says in the, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I think it's very important to have people that we seek advice from. I think it's very important that we have people we seek counsel from. But it's not good if we seek counsel from the right, wrong people. Okay? Especially if we're seeking it from our friend who we know is going to tell us what we want to hear anyways. Okay? This is the first thing he does. He goes to the wise men. Oh, they know the stars. They'll, they'll have the answers for me. What should I do with this woman who defied me in front of all these men? It's all about ego, all right? She defied me in front of all these men. They, they knew it. What do I do to her? So he asked the wise men who, again, usually give bad advice. Anyways, look at verse 14 and 15. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shethar, Admetha, Tarshish, Maris, Marsena, and Mimukin. Couldn't they just be Paul and John and Steve and Mimukin? The seven princes of Persia and Media, which uh, saw the king's face, in which sat the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king of Hazarus by the chamberlains. So next he consults the yes men. His first advisors are guys who are going to give bad advice. His second group is people who are just going to say, whatever you want, king, we agree. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, if you've been, ever been in a church where the deacon board was comprised of yes men, you found out very quickly if the pastor said it was going to happen because the deacons were just going to say yes. All right? Um, I, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm all for supporting the pastor, but I think there's, the, the, there's a board of deacons or trustees or both or whatever there may be in each church that's there for a reason to add counsel and wisdom and guidance and opinions uh, to work with each other, not for each other. Okay? And so I think it's good to have that. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't get upset if somebody says, I disagree. I got a different thought. Let's hear it. Let's talk about it. Let's figure this out. Uh, so he goes to his yes men. These are my guys I know are going to tell me exactly what, what I want to hear. Uh, now, I want you to think about this as well. The yes men, number one, are just as drunk as he is. Okay? And number two, they're, they're, they, want to, they want to curry favor with the king. They, they, yeah, they're not out to get in trouble here. They want to they promote the king and make sure he's happy with what they say. All right? So, let's look what they say. Look at verse 16. 16 through, through 18 here. Mamukin decides he's going to be the leader of the pack. Actually, I think it's Memucan. But, uh, Memucan answered before the king and the prince, uh, princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only but also to all the princes, all of us men, all of us guys who should be uh, 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 you know, submitted to by these lowful, lowly women. I'm, I'm reading into this a little bit, but that's, this is his attitude, okay? To all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, 
He's saying, you know, he didn't, she didn't just, she didn't just uh, insult the king. Every prince, every ruler, every governor, every man in, in all these provinces, she has insulted. Look at verse 17. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women. Now, I think this is his real worry. Okay? Again, as we read the book of Esther, we're familiar with the story, but sometimes we miss some of the inner things here, okay? Because we, we go for the plot. Uh, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king of Hazarus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media uh, say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. Memucan warns of the damage done to the king and all men. He, uh, he, he is thinking about if these women start to think, they're not going to listen to us anymore. Because we all know women are smarter than men, <laughs> right? <laughs> we know it. I ain't going to argue it. If we can't keep them under our thumbs, they're going to they're gonna rise up against us. And if they've heard that one got away with it, we're going to go home. And I'm going to go home. My wife's going to rise up against me. And, and this guy's why and this guy, and it's going to spread. And all of a sudden, we're going to have a revolt on our hands. Now, you got to understand, during these days, there's no equality between man and woman. Uh, the rights of women were non-existent. Uh, men controlled everything. A woman was considered pretty much an object. By the way, we still see that in some third world countries today. We, we, still, we still see that. Um, the, uh, the, the rights of women really weren't really gained until more modern times under Christianity. Um, now, unfortunately, unfortunately, <laughs> women have ran with those rights in our feminist movement and uh, have... have exasperated those rights and are not doing anything according to scripture as far as women's rights okay it's become more of a hey i'm gonna get what i want rather than men and women are equal okay we understand that uh but 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 memican warns about this he says dude these women are gonna assault us they're gonna kill us while we sleep they're gonna rise up against us we can't have that so what's the solution look at verse 19 if it please the king, we've got just a few more verses we'll be done. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and that the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. So the queen, oh, wrong button. The queen, letter D, hold on, we'll get it. There we go. The queen is to be humiliated and removed. Just get rid of her. This will solve the problem. We'll show ladies if you stand up against your husband, you'll lose everything you have. You'll be on the streets to fend for yourself. That's, that's the solution. Now, again, this maybe is fortunate for her because she could have been beheaded. Okay, so maybe, maybe this isn't as extreme as it could have been. Uh, she gave up her throne, her luxuries, her life of ease, her friends, her servants, and all that type of thing. But she did it out of principle instead of taking the easy way. And, and, and Memucan, all he thought was, if we make an example out of her, our women will stay silent. That's all he cared about. Uh, and uh, uh, she, she said, I'm, I'm going to stand out of principle. And if that's what happens to me, that's what happens to me. I'm not choosing the easy way. You know, I thought about that and I thought, what a contrast to what the Bible teaches about the relationship between men and women. The Bible tells men to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, I know we struggle with that from time to time, and it's not always easy, and we, uh, we learn and we grow in that area. I get that, but you see the drastic difference? Throw her away. No, praise her, love her, heal her, help her, promote her. Uh, so you see the big difference there. Look at verse number 20. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all the empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both the great and small. Even the most measly servant, his wife has to honor him because of what we do to Vashti here. So Memucan advises a decree to keep the women under control. That's the whole purpose of this. 
we got to keep the women in their place. Now, this is possible to me, and it, it leads me to think maybe he was having trouble with his wife. I'm just saying. Maybe he's having some issues, and he's thinking, if I can get this fixed for the king, it'll fix it for me. <laughs> okay. Now, again, I don't know. That's not Scripture necessarily, but uh, maybe that was the case. Uh, but he seemed to be very concerned with making sure women honored men. Um, but you know what? I see no concern about husbands honoring their wives. I don't see that. That's just as long as my woman submits. And by the way, we, we struggle with that in today's culture. If she would submit more, I'd love her more. Like I'm, No, 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 no. See, the two don't intersect. My command is to love. Her command is submit. If I'm not doing my job, she's still supposed to do hers. Does that make sense? And if she's not doing her job, I'm still supposed to do mine. They don't, they don't uh, re- rely on each other. But here, maybe you can just says, I have no responsibility. As long as she honors me, everything will be good. Look at verse 21 and 22. And the saying pleased the king and the princes. Of course it did. And the king did according to the word of Memucan. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. I've said this for years. If you have to say, I'm the man, I wear the, uh, I wear the pants in this family, I'm the head of this house, you're not. If you have to tell me you are, you ain't, all right? Uh, but that's what this decree is saying. Even the wimpy little henpecked husband is the head of the house because the king says so. Woman, get yourself in place. That's what he's teaching. That's what he's teaching. Uh, the decree was made then by the king. He follows the advice of this drunken servant of his. Uh, he puts it into play. It's decreed throughout the entire vastness of the kingdom. It's written in every language. Make sure everybody understands. Make sure every husband gets a copy so that every woman listens. Okay? And, and I'm going to give you this last thought here, and, and we're, we're done with chapter 1. In the providence of God, again, his, his name's not mentioned. You don't see his name in those, that first chapter. The dethroning of Vashti had to take place. Because it made way for the enthroning of Esther. Who then, later on in the book as we continue to read, would be used to preserve the Jewish nation. I'm going to close with a verse we quote. It's cliche to many of us. and We say it a lot around here often. And we should continue to say it. But claim it and mean it from the heart. A good, a good verse that plays with chapter 1 right here. Romans 8, 28. For we know all things work together for good to them that love God. Then we are all called according to his purpose. Vashti, what did I do? I just, I stood for right. Well, God was behind the scenes. Pushing you out, per, per, so to speak, to bring Esther in. And of course, we'll see later on in the scripture, you, you read that phrase, for such a time as this. Uh, she was brought in for a purpose at an exact time, at an exact location, in an exact way, so that God could use her to save his people. And, and that's what we're going to see through the whole book. Uh, you're never going to see God doing some big miraculous, look at me. But behind the scenes, he's going to be pushing and promoting and moving. God is like the master chess player. And he's going to be moving pieces around the board that we don't see to get his will accomplished in the lives of his people. And that's how it starts in the book of Esther. Next week, we'll pick up in chapter 2, and we're going to see the king chooses a new queen. I wonder who he'll choose. Anybody know? <laughs> so if you want to, you can read up on chapter 2 and uh, just kind of get some of the uh, uh, more context of it rather than just he picks Esther. Uh, you can read some of the in-between stuff there if you'd like to and uh, be ahead of the game when we get back for next Wednesday. So we get all our blanks filled in tonight. All right, any questions, comments, thoughts? How many of you would like to be married to a man like Ned Buchan? Anybody? I didn't think so. All right. All right, let's pray and we'll get out of here. Father, we thank you tonight for loving us. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the Bible, Lord. And we thank you for the book of Esther. Not a, not a, a real long book. And again, Lord, not a book that, that, that mentions your name, but Lord, a book that is full of just reminding your children of the providence of God. And uh, Lord, you're in control and you're sovereign. And Lord, I, I hope that as we study through Esther, even though she's familiar to us, I hope that we'll be reminded often of how much you love us and care for us. And you are behind the scenes of our life dictating 
uh, every event in allowing things to happen for your good and glory and, and even for our good, Lord. And I just pray we'll trust you more through this as a result of studying through Esther, I pray. Father, we ask you tonight as we go home, just give us safety as we travel, please. And uh, bless us the remainder of this week. Uh, bless our activities the remainder of this week. And may we live for you and, and tell people about you. And we ask you to be with the weekend services, Lord, and, and meet with us again. And uh, uh, do something special, Lord, in our hearts and our lives this Sunday, we pray. We thank you again for all you do and what you'll continue to do in our lives. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, goodbye. God bless you. Shake a couple hands. Don't forget about the gift card collection for our college kids. If you want to help with that, uh, you can bring some in this Sunday. We would appreciate that. And we will see you all on Sunday.